Well, good morning. Thank you all for joining. Uh, we welcome you to the joint informational hearing on California's wine uh, industry and uh, from the S Senate Select Committee on Wine and the Assembly Select Committee on Wine as well. On behalf of Assemblywoman Aguiar Curry and Senator Dodd, we could not be more grateful that you would join us on this glorious raining morning. Uh, and we also couldn't be more excited to be able to be in the city of Hillsburg, where the Dry Creek um, and Alexander Valleys converge on the Russian River. And we want to say thank you, first off, to the city of Hillsburg uh, for hosting us today. We couldn't be more grateful for their hospitality. Um, and was honored to be able to serve on this city council here for six years. And I'm pretty sure there's about uh, 12 leftover Kit Kats from a few years ago in Senator Dodd's uh, drawer. So uh, please help yourself, sir. Uh, and by the way, I want to point out uh, a very fitting tie that uh, the senator has on. He wins best tie contest right there. Look at that, uh, full of cork. So I like it, sir. Thank you so much. I hey, see, there we go. Uh, I want to say thank you to Senate Co-Chair Dodd uh, and Assemblywoman uh, Chair uh, Aguiar Curry for all their great work on agricultural and wine issues throughout this great state. They really are fantastic partners. Uh, today's panels are uh, to cover crucial topics facing the wine community. The first two panels will cover the devastating firestorm that tore through the North Bay last fall uh, and the recovery we're all working together on even as we speak. And while the grape harvest and much of the wine industry was fortunate enough uh, to largely escape its extensive damage during the fires, there have been numerous repercussions since. This Sunday will mark the six-month anniversary since the fires. And while significant progress has been made on the community cleanup, uh, and we are just about complete, by the way, the long-term impacts are still being realized. And while we begin to work towards rebuilding, residents are still displaced, structures are still gone, and there are still many unknowns. One of the largest impacts the fires had on the wine industry had to do with tourism. It was a very tough fall for most of our area. Now, here's the, um, the, contr the contrast. Many hotels are actually full right now, but they're full with families who have been displaced by the fires and workers who have traveled to the North Bay seeking employment. And while this is good news for the industry, uh, it is an extreme challenge for those families who have been displaced and lost their home. For the 2018 year to date, we're seeing hotel occupancy rates up by an average of about 17% and will likely remain this way for quite some time. And while this is generally good news, there is a long-term concern since the increase is due mostly to displaced residents and workers and not visitors. The Sonoma County Airport is also seeing a significant uptick after a pretty significant loss after the fires. They saw a 17% decrease in customer traffic during the month of the fires. But February, they actually saw an 18% increase compared to last year. The biggest area of worry, I think for all of us, is customer perception. As you will hear today, there are still lingering misperceptions, regionally, nationally, and throughout the world, about what wine country looks like after the fires. But the story we want to tell the world today is that our communities are open, and we're coming together like never before. We're open for business, and there hasn't been a better time to be able to visit our region. You'll hear about the inspiring new creative initiatives today that have been launched or will soon be kicked off, welcoming folks back to Sonoma, Napa, Lake, and Mendocino counties. We're looking forward to hearing from our panelists and all in attendance about how we can better serve their efforts and how we can let the world know the welcome mat is out. We'll also be talking about water, and I want to say thank you to the Assemblywoman and the Senator for their work on this issue particularly. And we'll be focusing on water supply issues for the industry in our communities. The next drought may not be this year or next, but we know it will be coming, and we need to be fully prepared. California's wine, country, wine community have truly been leaders on water smart farming, and we're going to be hearing from some of those leaders here today. Finally, I want to say thank you to the Wine Institute for their help with organizing today's hearing. Uh, these committees have long been dedicated to working hand-in-hand -hand with the wine community, and all of us look forward to that continuing partnership. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to uh, our co-chair, Senator Dodd, with a special presentation. Then we're going to turn the floor over to the chairwoman, Assemblyman Aguiar Curry. Senator Dodd. Good morning, everybody, and thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, my colleagues, uh, Senator McGuire and Assemblymember Aguiar Curry. This is a great partnership that we've had. We've been uh, 
you know, we've been to Napa, we've been uh, to Santa Barbara, and uh, what we, our plan is, is to, uh, over the terms that we have, is to take this all over to the wine industry all throughout the state of California and start engaging uh, everybody in the, you know, in the wine industry. So I appreciate uh, uh, the cooperation and, and the partnership there. I'd also like to thank our uh, panelists uh, for being here today and members of the audience. I know uh, uh, maybe this is a good day to be indoors when it's raining outside, but uh, you still had to drive here and take the time to do it, and I appreciate that very much. Uh, we get started today, though, I think on, oh, and also Mike said it, but I, I do, this is really important when we can get a, a, you know, an opportunity to be in a place that's public, that has the space and the parking and everything, and so thanks to the city of Healdsburg for hosting us. Uh, as we get started today on a positive note, uh, we're going to honor the newest AVA in Sonoma County. The Petaluma Gap AVA used to be a part of the Sonoma County AVA, some of Coast AVA, excuse me but truly deserves its own designation. And that's the good news today, but we also have some harsh realities to discuss. As Mike said, last year's fires burned significant acreage. Most of the crop was already harvested, but the ripple effects on housing, the environment, and the workforce will be felt for years. We want the California wine industry to know we celebrate and value your place in the local and the state economy. I hope today we can learn more and work on those solutions to these complex challenges. So with that, I think what we're going to do is we're going to uh, present a proclamation, resolution of some kind to Petaluma ABA. Somebody here representing Petaluma? All good. And I'll make it short and sweet. Um, I'm honored to be here today, and I'm really thrilled with the outcome. Because some of these committee hearings, we don't have very many people attend. So I guess the rain helps because you want to be inside. Um, but first of all, the benefit of these committee hearings for me and my colleagues is the education piece. Um, you sit in the Capitol, and you try to understand the uh, industry better. Uh, I farm. I farm walnuts. But it's not the same as our grape. Um, Grape growers. So I'm honored that you're here today. I hope I learned a lot more that I can take back to my colleagues at the Capitol. And uh, I'm looking forward to this getting started. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chairwoman, and thank you, Mr. Co-Chair. Uh, we'd like to be able to do some quick housekeeping. Uh, right now, we are being streamed live, so just know um, that we will be live on the net throughout this hearing. And then, of course, we're going to be archiving the hearing. There will be three different panels. Each panelist will be given five to seven minutes. We'll be giving each panelist a 30-second heads up, not trying to be pushy, but making sure that we're able to leave plenty of time for questions. We'll be opening up public comment in between each of the panels. Each individual who would like to be able to comment, and we do welcome your comments, will be given two minutes, and if you don't mind, just listing your first and last name. The three panels will be focused on fire, uh, in, uh, fire and industry recovery, industry and tourism, a very special update about where we're at here in the wine country when it comes to tourism numbers, and the final uh, piece will be focused on water supply. So without further ado, we'd like to be able to kick it off with the president of the Sonoma County Wine Growers, who is just back from Tijuana, uh, looking at the H-2A worker program. Uh, and uh, I'm sure she will have plenty to say about that at a later hearing. But we welcome Carissa Cruz. And then we're going to hear, hear from Garrett Buckland. He is the president of the Napa Valley Wine Growers and owner of Premier Viticulture as well. We're going to turn it over to Ms. Cruz to be able to kick us off on a fire and industry recovery up update. We welcome both of you to the hearing. 
Thank you. Good morning, honorable chairs. Thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this conversation today. And also thank you for your continued support of our wine community, agriculture, tourism, really, really important to Sonoma County, Napa, and our North Bay area. So I, we really appreciate that. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the impact on the vineyards of the October fires, the impact on our employees, and what we're doing now as recovery and some of our communication strategies. So I did include just a two-page overview in your binders. Most importantly, I wanted to draw your attention to these two pretty incredible pictures that I put on the front, um, one representing a vineyard really close to the Coffee Park neighborhood and another one of our pastures, I believe down um, more in the Sonoma Valley area. And so what these pictures really demonstrated is what we started hearing probably about day two of the October fires was that our vineyards and our, our grazing land were actually acting as natural fire breaks. Mm -hmm. And so um, that one vineyard picture that I'm, I'm sharing is actually one photo, although it looks like it's sort of two photos superimposed, but you see where the fire actually stops as it hits the vineyards. And so I think it's just important, you know, we're almost six months in to you know, recall that our, our farmers and our vineyards were really there as part of the solution. Um, our reservoirs on our ag land was, the water was used to help um, fight the fires and a lot of our farmers were actually out on their farms in their vineyards with their own fire trucks helping fight these fires as well. So um, we were really part of that solution during such a devastating time. Uh, the good news, um, if there is good news coming out of the October fires, is that this viable uh, economic resource agriculture in our community really did uh, have very little damage. So on the second page, uh, if you'll flip over, um, as the, these numbers are from the Ag Commissioner, um, but there's only about 2,500 acres of vineyard out of our 60,000 acres of vineyard in Sonoma County that were even in the fire zone. So when you look at the three major fires, the Tubbs, the Nuns, and, um, and the uh, pocket fire that was up north, there was only 2,500 acres with even potential impact. Of those, really lucky is that what was reported to the Ag Commissioner so far is that less than 100 acres, 91.74 acres, were actually reported to have received some sort of loss, damage, crop loss. So we're looking, um, you know, total 4% of our vineyards were in the fire zone and a, a negligible number, less than 100 acres, had any reported impact or loss. And that uh, resulted in about a million, just over a million dollars of crop loss and damage reported so far. So um, again, the fire, the vineyards were acting as natural fire breaks and received, at least on the Sonoma County side, very little damage. However, as we know, we're just entering bud break. Uh, now with the rain here pushing, that'll help uh, even more. And our farmers are still kind of in a, a wait and see mode, I would say, with the actual overall impact of those 2,500 acres that were in the fire zone. So, um, looking at, you know, will bud rake successfully happen uh, in those vineyards that were in, in those fire zones? Um, will the production levels be the same? And then as we go through harvest, will the quality of those production levels, you know, be as good as we've come to expect from our, you know, premium wine regions um, here in the North Bay? So we're still in a little bit of a wait and see mode. Um, fortunately, we were 90% plus through the harvest here in Sonoma County, as you mentioned in the opening remarks. Uh, primarily, you know, 60% of our county is planted to Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. So our farmers grumbled with the high heats over Labor Day weekend, but they actually served to expedite our harvest, uh, especially of those two important varieties for Sonoma County. So, um, and then, you know, our, that whole West County where it was safe, a lot of our growers were still able to um, get to their vineyards and farm. And, and a huge thank you to our Ag Commissioner, Tony Linegar. Um, they, I think, supported over about 500 permits to get some of our growers in and our farmers back when it was safe to their vineyards to harvest or to get animals out safely. And so it was a great partnership with our Ag Commissioner during these fire times. Um, in terms of you know, the impact on our actual uh, em employees, that was where we started to feel real concern. So about nine days after the fire started, in partnership with the Sonoma County Farm Bureau, we launched a housing recovery fund directly for ag employees and their families, regardless of documentation. Um, this fund, amazingly, has raised over $950,000 in the last couple of months since October. Um, we've supported over 200 ag families 
we are doing rent support up to two years. We've purchased RVs. Um, we've given gift cards to replace loss of food, um, loss of wages, and we continue to get some of those requests in. And we're now shifting gears to a longer-term focus of long, you know, uh, affordable housing uh, targeted to our ag employees. So that effort, and that I think is where our biggest ask is, is really helping us um, remove any of those barriers to quick uh, affordable housing options in our county where they may exist at the state level. And then finally, just on a communication strategy, and I'll wrap up with that. Um, we've been doing interviews, I know 70 plus interviews in the first couple of weeks during the fires. Those continue as we talk about the impact um, and really inviting our community back here. Also that we believe we still have a very successful um, amazing quality uh, vintage 2017 that will be being bottled um, has already started to be bottled will continue to be bottled over the next couple of years um, we've been doing uh, trips we just got back from New York City for a press trip uh, we're doing mini Sonoma in the cities in six different cities for the next six months doing a lot of education and communication with our press as well as a partnership with videos with Food and Wine magazine that will go out nationally. So we continue now to really be focused on taking care of our employees and the recovery options, working in partners with Fitner and uh, Sonoma County Tourism, who you'll hear from, and how we get the message out that we're here. We're open. The 2017 Vintage is strong. Please come visit us and buy Sonoma County wine. Thank you so much, Ms. Cruz. I know we'll have some questions. We'll hold our questions until uh, Mr. Buckland uh, provides us a presentation, sir. I'll give you a 30-second prompt, and we welcome you, and thank you for making the drive. Great. Thank you so much for having me. I um, wanted to reintroduce myself, Garrett Buckland, uh, president of the Napa Valley Grape Growers. Um, we are a, a, a group of over 700 uh, different vineyard and winery owners in Napa County. And um, <clears throat> want to say thank you again for um, uh, the invite here to share our experience with the fires and, and what we're doing to move on. Um, so a lot of uh, similar messages that we have um, uh, that was coming out of Sonoma County. Um, everyone's well aware we had quite a few acres, uh, wildland acres burned, over 70,000 acres in, in Napa County. Um, the good thing is that there's only about 126 acres of actual vineyards that uh, fall in that category of, of damaged or, or, or heavily uh, um, uh, damaged or destroyed in that in that uh, total number. So a very small amount overall. Um, we are looking to what bud break brings and see if there's any delayed uh, effect with uh, shoot growth and, and other plant issues there. Um, I do want to echo what Chris has said about uh, vineyards as fire breaks. We're hearing from our, our friends at uh, Cal Fire that uh, the, these are these are really wonderful tools to help uh, uh, set up um, you know bigger buffer areas around uh, the urban interface as well uh, and really keep damage down. So I do want to um, highlight that and think about how we can uh, look at further land use policies moving forward to uh, utilize a, a low fuel uh, uh, environment like uh, uh, vineyards and, and grazing and things of that nature. Um, uh, getting into what happened during the fires, um, I want to highlight some of the roles that our nonprofits played. Uh, we do uh, at NVG, we have uh, uh, 12 staff members that uh, immediately went out and helped the community. Uh, we were supplying uh, free N95 masks to all of our members uh, and other uh, people at large, um, uh, getting out erosion control uh, materials for free post-fire. Uh, we set up an erosion control fair, which was really helpful and uh, had a lot of uh, uh, uptake from uh, both the community uh, at large and vineyard owners that came and accessed uh, free erosion control materials so that we could better um, uh, protect some of the wild areas, uh, especially around our, around our water resources. Um, vineyard owners are very, uh, uh, very, very much adept at putting out erosion control measures. It's something in Napa County that is, is mandatory for most of our vineyards. Uh, and so we had a really great technical um, group of folks that could help uh, install that in, in the broader community. Um, we had wonderful partnerships through this fire with uh, NRCS and RCD, uh, as well as uh, folks uh, through CAL FIRE and CAL OES and everyone else at the federal level as well. Um, I, I want to uh, highlight that. I think this is something that we don't want to see another one of these, but if we do, uh, I think we are well prepared uh, to get, make sure that the recovery efforts uh, go even more smoothly. Um, <clears throat> so most of our grapes, 90% or more, were harvested before the fires. Um, and, uh, and so we did have some acute challenges that um, our, our county officials and, and CAL FIRE uh, helped us get back into properties to really reduce some of the potential damage uh, uh, from, to those businesses. Um, one thing that we are looking at is the, the ongoing uh, wine quality uh, concerns. We do have um, concerns about smoke exposure uh, for some of the wines that were uh, as part of these, these post-fire 
areas and, and we're getting a lot of feedback now from our, our winery partners that um, the, the quality of these wines are still really good. Um, you know, it, we in Napa County and, and most wine regions uh, never put out a product that is a, a subpar in quality. And so you'll see not many of those wines ever ever reach the market at all. Um, and so I think that's a really good thing. Uh, there are quite a bit of uh, damage uh, uh, things that we're hearing from individual property owners, um, uh, piping, erosion control, uh, equipment buildings, uh, actual equipment, fences, things like that that are, are uh, in progress with um, uh, with them recovering from. Um, so I think that's that's a, a good update from where we're at. Most uh, vineyard owners, I think, are, are confident going into the season uh, that they'll be able to keep their businesses healthy and uh, survive through this this um, this area. Um, one thing that we do have uh, a concern, we have uh, our waste discharge requirements, um, uh, and I think that's the ask that I'd like of this um, uh, committee to take a look at. Uh, we were uh, successful in working with them to have a delay of implementation uh, for some of the areas that are, are hardest hit by the fires, so some of the properties that um, lost everything and, and have a hard time complying with these rules. Um, and so we, we have an ongoing uh, relationship with the Water Board, and, and we hope that they'll be sympathetic to um, <clears throat> making sure that everybody can be compliant uh, and, and uh, consider a little bit more of a delay for us to uh, get everybody into the program. Um, and then the only other additional ask, uh, like always, we would love that uh, the state of California helps with uh, research funding um, for all of our uh, uh, different concerns in the wine grape business. Um, and then uh, we do, we will learn quite a bit about effects of fire and, um, and quality parameters on wine. And we hope that we can prop that research up um, through this committee. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Buckland. We'd like to be able to open it up for questions or comments from the committee before we go to the public, please. Yeah, I have a, a couple of comments. Uh, my frustration during the fires is the same as yours. I thought the media went just a little bit too far. I mean, I appreciate the fact that we wanted to keep people out um, in uh, coming while we were trying to deal with the fires, but I think my frustration was for you as well as that you're still open for business and trying to get that message across was tough. I think that we tried to do a really good job along the way is that we're strong, we're still going to be moving forward. So um, has there been discussions with the major... Um, Media outlets is like, you know, have a conversation with the tourism or whatever, agriculture. It's like, where are we really? Uh, because I, I, I think a lot of people canceled wedding plans up here. They canceled events up here. When in reality, they probably didn't have to do that. I think you're going to hear probably more from my colleague on the tourism part. But I know, I think we're all, and I think just the important communication for all of us is wherever we go, um, no matter what our role representing our counties that were impacted, it's important to communicate that we're open for business. And I know, you know when we have a chance to talk about our vineyards and our wine, we're doing just that and doing more than we've kind of ever done. And I know um, just in our presentations, we're now starting everything. It just, it helps just to start every conversation with an update on the fires. Yeah. And then you get into, okay, now we're going to shift to, it is business as usual, so let's get back to doing what we do best and talking about our great agriculture and our great wine here and our great tourism opportunities. And so I know for us, it's just an ongoing communication. I think we're going to have to overcome those images, and we're at six months, so those images are going to come right back, and then they're going to come back at a year again. Yeah. And so we're going to be, um, I think, more focused than ever um, to work together to do that. And I think everyone in our communities has that um, sense of responsibility. And my last comment was I, I appreciate what you're doing for housing for your the ag community. Um, uh, we've worked hard, uh, some, uh, Senator Dodd and I, doing some farm worker housing over for Napa. Um, I'm working on a bill now to update um, migrant housing, which has not been touched and uh, uh, amended for over 50 years. And we need to use those housing, particularly in this time. So we're trying to work on that. So um, I appreciate your two asks. And uh, I'm sure we'll have more discussions on those. Thank you. Senator Dodd. Yeah, Gary, can we talk a little bit more in depth on uh, that research that uh, the industry would like? I think that this is a great time, uh, you know, to be doing that. We all have a great relationship with Secretary Ross. Um, and, and I think that uh, if we could get a little bit more defined on what we'd like to do, where we'd like to do it, and, and maybe even just for our edification, what other type of re – I know UC Davis obviously has a lot of – maybe we can, we'll be talking uh, – you know, there as well, but 
you have some thoughts on that that we can kind of flush out here? Yeah, I think, um, you know, the, the broad um, the broad research that we've been looking at, uh, we, we had a, a big fire uh, issue in some of our, our North Coast counties in 2008, I believe, and so there was a lot of lessons learned uh, in there, and, and I think Glenn is here as well and can maybe speak to that later. Um, and, you know, the uh, fire and smoke can affect grapes at very differing times, and so we're having to rely oftentimes on, on research from other areas and their experience with it. Um, it would be nice to, to bolster that and, and make sure that um, a lot of the uh, uh, private dollars that have been spent on research uh, during this this uh, uh, fire area gets put to use in a broad um, a broad spectrum that we can uh, educate not just our industry uh, here in, in California, but other people that may go through this as well. Um, it's very critical when these things happen at harvest. There's not a lot of time to make fast decisions. And so I think that's a, that was a, a real concern. Everybody was scrambling for information. It would be really nice to, to really bolster that information bank if we can. Um, and leverage some of the private and, and public funds to make sure that happens. Um, so this is an ongoing bigger question, and, and I think there's ways that we can integrate with UC Davis uh, and our local farm advisors to, to gather a lot of um, that information and, and put it to good use. Yeah, wh one of the things that, that I'm thinking, I, I, I think it's important that uh, Sonoma, Napa, Mendo, Lake, you know, get together, um, you know, and, and maybe Ms. McGordy could, you know, I think to have something sooner rather than later, what we're, what we're doing is we're going, we're going to go here from one administration that we've got through the end of this year, and then there's going to be a new administration. And a lot of things, we're, the, we're all, the North Bay delegation with uh, Assemblymember Wood and Assemblymember Levine as well, is we're working on a plan, and we're going to try to get some language in the plan that it just doesn't end you know, with this administration. We need to make sure, because this is not a one- to two-year problem uh, that we've got. So this research is kind of new to me in terms of, you know, hearing that as a potential budget item, but I think it's important. And if we could get something back, it doesn't have to be exact, but like an outline of what uh, things we think is, you know, important and, and get with the academia to, to try to get a handle on what that'll take to do it so that we can make a, an educated guess on what we're going to have to ask for uh, with this administration moving forward. Uh, it's, it's kind of ironic we're just, you brought up the technical and some of the uh, new ideas that are out there. I had the opportunity to um, hear a conversation and I met with uh, Scripps Institute talking about some of the new cameras they have out there that they could predict um, in, um, where the fire is going and the direction and help the firefighters get it away from whether urban or farmland or whatever. And those are some of the new technologies that are out there that are with satellite imaging as well as with the um, rains that we're having now, they can predict a Pineapple Express coming, you know, days and days in advance to help the farmers, help our, our uh, water system. So I think there's things out there, and I really appreciate the fact we need to do public-private partnerships. Um, the government can't do it all, but we're willing to, I think we need to open up uh, and be more flexible than we have been in the past. And, you know, as we look at climate change and things along that line, we have to work sooner than later. So. Um, I, I love the new technology that's coming our way, and I'm hoping another committee, we will uh, invite some of those people to join us. No, thank you so much, Assemblywoman. Just a, a few questions, and, and this is just on uh, anecdotal, I'm sure. Uh, some of it will be for the vintners as well, but I just want to see if you have any anecdotal data that you're seeing, for example, like a winter wineland promotion that's coming up in Sonoma County or an equivalent in Napa County. If you can talk about what you're hearing from your growers in regards to numbers. And then I'd also be interested uh, if you have growers who also uh, have their own winery uh, and talk about traffic that's been coming in. Understand this is a slower season, but if you can just give us uh, a, a taste of what you're seeing uh, coming through the valleys, uh, both domestic and international travel, and do you believe that it's been impacted by the fires? If you, um, please, Ms. Cruz. Okay, I'll start. Um, a good question, and you're right, it's all anecdotal right now. Sure. Like I said, I believe Claudia will provide some tourism update numbers, but, you know, we're hearing it's really mixed, to be honest, um, which I think is probably just par for course with the, with most businesses. So I've heard some folks, and um, we had, you know, some of the, the uh, winter uh, barrel tastings had, you know, better than ever, more more customers than ever, or even less customers, but I want to say more qualified customers, and that they're actually spending, so spending would be up. Um, so I think it's, um, and then I've heard others have said, oh, it was a little bit more of a struggle to get here, or maybe we had less numbers. So it really, I think it's hard to generalize right now. I mean, there's no doubt 
October is a prime tourism month for our, our vintner partners and you know we suffered a lot during October November but I think um, everyone is doing as you know a fantastic job of continuing to promote and I think we're seeing that individually from our wineries and our growers and our tourism partners as well as the associations that are sort of rallying everyone together. So I think the recovery is happening. And again, it's kind of been on a case-by-case -case basis. And I think it will take us probably that full year to really understand um, what if there's been a real a real change. Thank you, Ms. Buckler. Um, yeah, I, and I would echo a lot of that as well. I think we do have um, not really my wheelhouse to, to um, summarize those things in terms of traffic. But anecdotally, from a lot of the people that I work with, um, you know, we had an initial slump of, of uh, people coming through. And, and that was immediately post-fires. It seems to have recovered uh, quite a bit. A lot of that's due to the, uh, again, the positive image that we are portraying, which really is true. Um, and, I, and I think, you know, this is just an opportunity for us to uh, uh, make sure that we're getting the messaging out properly, that we are open for business. And um, I would expect that uh, a normal season to, to hopefully uh, come out of this. Okay. I was just going to add, I, I do know my own experience, I've, I travel a lot, that I've been in a number of restaurants where I've not announced where I was from, and there have been um, server psalms actually saying, hey, please buy a bottle of Sonoma County wine, buy a bottle of Napa Valley wine, support them right now, they're helping recover, and so that's been, I think some of our messaging has been really resonating, I know I spent one of the first weekends in, in San Francisco after the fires, and I just I about hugged the, the gentleman that supported that. So um, I think the more we can say even everywhere in the world, you can still support us locally rebuild and our, our families rebuild by supporting one of our biggest um, economic drivers. It's really important. Thank you. I, and I think I just uh, just two other comments. You know, one is uh, legislature put forward this affordable housing bond that has 300 million in for farm worker housing to be able to replenish the Joe Cerna funds, which I think will be a really nice complement to what the industry is already moving forward with. And really with Napa County of what you have in the ongoing basis and want to say thank you to the Assemblywoman and Senator for moving the bill last year to be able to increase that um, and obviously working with the industry as well. And then I think on all issues of fire cameras, I think whether it's, uh, what, and the Assemblywoman brought up some really good points and I was just talking with the Senator about this, Sonoma County Water Agency is very interested in these fire cameras and they, they've deployed them in San Diego County where um, to be able to protect watersheds. So if you have a significant fire, for example, in our neck of the woods at the Lake Sonoma watershed, that's going to impact customers uh, not just here in Sonoma County, but down in Marin as well. It's the main water source uh, for uh, hundreds of thousands of North Bay residents. And the sooner we can get on these fires, the better uh, for suppression. So I think there's, um, there's a dual purpose for these fire cameras that could uh, also help industry as well as government and protect our water supply as well. So without further ado, why don't we open it up to any individual who would like to be able to speak uh, on these, uh, on any of the issues that you just heard from this panel. We welcome any individual to be able to come forward. Please state your first and last name. Uh, and if you can, if you don't mind, if you'd like to be able to ask a question, just direct it to the panel, uh, excuse me, to the dais here. Anyone would like to be able to speak on this panel? Please come on forward. We'll have you right up here to the podium. You have two minutes and we welcome you. Yep, just go ahead and hit that button. Hi, I'm Glenn McGordy. I'm going to be speaking later, but I just wanted to add to the issue on, on uh, off flavors from smoke that there is a, a collaborative movement going on between Washington State, Oregon State, and University of California to look at this because it's a, it's a West Coast problem. And uh, next week I'll be flying to British Columbia to speak at Lake o uh, Okanagan to talk to them about our experiences with smoke because they also experience it in Canada as well. So this is a big issue that I think is part of climate change as we continue to fight with these really wild fires that come in. They're not just wildfires, they're wild wildfires that do so much damage. Thank you. No, thank you so much. Thank you for those comments. Would anyone else like to be able to speak? We welcome you to please come forward. All right, we wanna say thank you to our first panel. Uh, thank you so much, Ms. Cruz, Mr. Buckland, for all your work. We're gonna be transitioning to our next panel, which is gonna be moderated by Senator Bill Dodd, which is gonna be focused on industry and tourism. And we'll turn it over to the Assemblywoman to be able to moderate our water supply panel. Senator Dodd. Fantastic. Uh, tours, tourism related to the wine industry is one of the main drivers of the local economy. We know a significant number of visitors come here solely to taste and purchase locally made wines. Visitors stay in hotels, go shopping, patronize restaurants at a high rate. All this generates revenues to keep local governments afloat. 
We saw a sharp drop in these revenues, even in communities that had no direct damage from the fires, like the city of uh, Sonoma, for example. That is why it's so critical to continue to market this region as an amazing destination that it is. We need tourism, especially now. So with that, we are going to call up the next uh, panel and um, uh, honor uh, Comfort, the executive in residence at the Wine Business Institute in McCounty Tourism. Welcome. Clay Gregory, president and CEO of Visit Napa Valley. And Shelby Sim, president and CEO of Visit the San Inez Valley. Welcome. So why don't we get started in that order? Great, right, thank you. Right. Uh, and first of all, thank you so much to all of you for your continued focus on this issue as what the industry pulls itself out of it. But um, as stated earlier, this was a significant impact and it will be, will be a long road for all of us. But um, I'm going to share a little bit of background that will actually, I think, set some context for comments from uh, my colleagues here. And um, this really centers around some work that was done by the Wine Business Institute at Sonoma State University that launched actually during the fires. And it started with a conversation on October 10th when we quickly realized that we had, as an academic institution, we had an opportunity, but also a responsibility to share the, some fact-based information and correct the story that was being portrayed around the world of what was actually occurring here in Sonoma County, Napa County, Mendocino, and Lake Counties during the fires. Um, and it's significant that uh, the, as an institution, we were able to take a step back and focus on the entire North Coast region um, in the work that we did. So all of the, the facts and the information that I'll be sharing really ties back to that entire region of the five counties that were affected by the fires. We quickly realized that that was going to be essential because as the fires were uh, dynamic and moving through this region and, and working across um, all five counties, that's also in line with the way that our industry works. Whereas a winery may be located in, in Napa, um, they will certainly buy grapes from other regions and their employees will live in, a, in another region. And so we work across county lines, the fire worked across county lines. We felt it was essential that we share with the world what the true impact was on the wine industry from that same perspective. And while we recognize the devastating effects across our communities, we also saw that it was vital that we share with the world that the fires were um, much more localized in terms of their impacts on the industry, the wine industry specifically. So during the early days of the fires, we quickly reached out to all of the wine and grape grower associations across the five regions in order to um, create a collaborative effort to share information and to communicate. As we saw the stories splashed across the media, we recognized it was going to be essential in the coming days to correct that story, share accurate and factual information of the impacts of the fires on the wine industry, and also forecast its recovery. So we moved quickly to um, collect data working across um, all of the associations, including partnering with our agricultural commissioners, with the grape growers, the winery associations, and um, individual grape growers and wineries themselves to collect consistent data. And what we found really centered around three key findings. The first was that the actual impact of the fires was heavily localized and isolated. Whereas there were significant, there was significant acreage that was within the fire zones, as Carissa stated in Sonoma County and as Garrett stated in Napa County, the, the actual acreage that was directly impacted by the fires was significantly less. We then also evaluated in terms of actual wineries directly impacted by the fires and we found similar findings. And I shared, I believe that you have uh, within your binders the, the press release that summarized some of the findings from our initial report and just to state some of those figures, that what we found was that across the North Coast region, 99.8% of vineyard acres were not directly impacted by the fires. 93% of wineries reported as unaffected by the fires, and that 99.5% of the total crop value was realized in 2017, which was in direct contrast to the way that this was portrayed in the media. Which leads to our second key finding, 
which was that the most significant and lasting impact of the fires has actually been this visitor slowdown due to the images portrayed in the media. We recognize that the media was, um, was moving quickly to deal with a dynamic situation, that information was challenging to get to, communication was compromised, that in many times they were doing their best to share what they knew. Unfortunately, it led to, as we all know, a very negative and um, escalated image that was portrayed. So um, we have seen that as one of the most um, significant, as I said, and lasting impacts. One of the things that was particularly challenging about the visitor slowdown is that, in fact, it, in fact, it impacted wineries that were outside of the fire zones directly. So it really stretched across the entire region. Which then leads to our third key finding, which was that while the impact was immediate and significant, that we also saw the recovery did start relatively quickly. Um, and as soon as November, we were starting to see visitor traffic return. Um, we also did see significant increases in terms of direct-to-consumer sales and tasting room sales that helped offset that slowdown. One of the challenges is that October, being the single most significant month in terms of consumer traffic and direct-to-consumer sales for the wineries, um, we lost those sales and those will not be recovered. We then faced the challenge of recovery during some of our slowest months of the year. So while we're seeing numbers month, excuse me, year over year begin to equalize and even improve, the challenge is that we will never fully regain the sales that we lost in October. And that has been a lasting impact on our industry. And that's one of the things that we're seeing wineries um, and growers today struggling with to overcome. As we're pulling out of the, um, as we're pulling further into the second quarter of the year in 2018, we're starting to see these numbers continue to improve and normalize. Um, to share, Again, more based on anecdotal data, since we don't have firm data yet in terms of actual winery visit numbers, what we did see was that through the first quarter of the year, uh, weekend traffic was starting to pick up. However, midweek traffic continued to be slow. It has varied um, winery to winery, but overall for the industry, we have seen a, a much more gradual recovery than we would have liked. Um, pulling, uh, as we're now stepping into April, we're seeing those numbers continue to increase. Industry events have been mixed. Some have been um, consistent with prior years. Others have been down. Fortunately, we are seeing individual sales increase um, overall. So there's a slight uptick in terms of the average purchase. But if that's, it, we're not seeing that necessarily enough to completely correct and cover the shortfalls that we experienced at the end of last year. When you say individual sales, and I apologize about Sorry, individual, direct. yeah, yeah, individual customer sales. We're seeing the average. Got it. So direct sales in the tasting rooms, you're starting Correct. to see. Got it. Correct. Correct. Um, and so uh, I'd like to conclude with, um, with pointing out that we're now preparing to enter phase two of our study, which is going to be a focus on really um, evaluating and most importantly, educating and communicating around the impacts of smoke and fire on wine. We recognize that um, there is a potential exposure for our industry in terms of a misperception around a quality story of wines from the 2017 vintage. And we see that the most significant way to um, offset that will be through educating trade, media, and consumers, and doing that from an industry perspective. So we've started a partnership with UC Davis, and we're working hand in hand with Professor David Block and Karen Block at UC Davis to put together a panel of both winemakers and growers to work with um, evaluating some of the assessment protocols and make recommendations back to the industry in terms of ways to manage and work with uh, any smoke-tainted or smoke-affected wines, but then most importantly, put together talking points and education points that we can share with the media and trade as we head into the back half of this year in order to, again, make certain that the correct story and image um, is portrayed, which is that a very, the. Overall, the impact of the fires was very localized and limited. The 
percentage of wine that was directly affected was extremely small, and the quality of the 2017 vintage will be at the level that all of our consumers, media, collectors, and buyers have come to expect from this region. Thank you, Honor. You know, we are so fortunate to have the Wine Business Institute and Sonoma State University in this district doing this work uh, and helping us. Thank you very, very much. Bonnie, before you um, uh, move into your presentation, I got a quick commercial break. You know, the three of us had a, have had an opportunity during this time of meeting a lot of wonderful people in the industry, constituents, people's homes burned, people that were impacted by the fires, a lot of first responders, state government, people that were responding, county government and city government. I know he's going to hate me for doing this, but I'd like to recognize uh, Fire Chief Tony Gosner from the city of Santa Rosa. There's no finer representative uh, of, the, of our first responders. This guy was absolutely amazing every step of the way during this. I'd like to give him a round of applause. Tony. Can I just say one more thing? Um, I'm glad you said something because when I saw him, I got chills because yeah, of all the wonderful things he'd done during the fire. So thank you very much, Tony. Can I just ask one quick question? Who were the UC Davis professors that are working with you? We're working with Dr. David Block. He's the head of the viticulture department, okay. and Karen Block, okay. and also Anita Obermeister. And um, we are putting that study together. So I did want to follow up on the yeah. comment. Um, they are absolutely looking for funding. And we are preparing an overview of what the specifics will be of the projects that re would require funding. We do have some private funding, but support and engagement with our public partners would be found, would be fantastic as we go forward. And so we can certainly follow up with you with additional detail in the coming weeks. That'd be, That'd be helpful. helpful. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Claudia Vecchio from Sonoma County Tourism. And I come at this in a little bit um, different uh, perspective. I started my job on November 1st, so much of what I talk about was this extraordinary team at Sonoma County Tourism that were there during the fires and really, I think, um, displayed an incredible uh, tenacity in getting this uh, the crisis communications uh, program underway right when the fires began. So my hat's off to this team who was in place before I got there. Um, you know, initially uh, during the fires, there was a, there's a fair, fairly standard crisis communications protocol that organizations will go through. And this, this, as I say, this team did this, I think, as well as can be done. I originally, you know, we shut off all of our communications, all of our marketing, and really um, hunkered down and did what we could to support the community, to support those who were um, on the front lines. And so uh, uh, one of the first things that we did was to, to uh, thank those who did uh, support us, the fire crews, all of their individuals. And so we went into a community relations mode right from the get-go. Uh, to ensure that we did everything we could for our community. Certainly many of those are employed in the tourism industry. One out of 10 Sonoma County residents are employed in the tourism industry, so it was important for us to work with our, our teams. But then, as has been mentioned uh, several times, once the fires were contained, once we knew that that um, uh, immediate need was over, it was absolutely imperative that we tout that we're open for business message. And we did this in a number of ways. Uh, we did have posters that went out, and you'll see these at a number of different properties around Sonoma County. Uh, but through our incredible work with the media and, and social media, and we did actually, I think for the first time ever, a joint ad with our friends in Napa Valley down in Sonoma and the uh, San Francisco Chronicle, we really showed that this whole region was open for business, and that is a message we tout to today. So you know, as a marketing organization, it is imperative for us to uh, work with our partners, work with our industry. We also got tremendous support from our friends at Visit California, the statewide tourism agency. They did a, an event called Grateful Table on the Sonoma Napa uh, County border and brought in great chefs like Tyler Florence and others to show that, um, again, that 
um, much as Sonoma County and Napa Valley still remained this pristine and beautiful location that it had has always been and always will be. But the perception certainly did um, persist then, and it to some extent certainly does today as well. So we we have done a number of different programs. Uh, one of our uh, key um, com uh, components and audiences is the meeting planner audience. We sell our major hotels through this way, and so we did an incentive. We always have a cash incentive for meeting planners coming into Sonoma County, but we added an additional incentive that allowed them a chance to give back to the fire relief efforts. And uh, to date, that uh, we've, we've had about seven meetings that have booked in Sonoma County specifically because of this incentive, and they've given back about $22,500 to, um, to the fire relief efforts. So good on the meetings community. As has been mentioned before, the industry has supported Sonoma County, and I suspect that all of us here in, in an extraordinary way. Uh, we are always a collaborative uh, industry, but in, but during this time, whether it be the, the our friends at uh, San Francisco Travel or meeting planners or uh, with the U.S. Travel Association or Visit California, everyone is supporting what we're doing, and it's been a tremendous outpouring uh, in that way. We did a piece, we did two pieces of research during this because perception and travel is everything. Perception is reality, and. Uh, so we did a, a consumer research of 800 consumers around the country, and um, the, the results were heartwarming That in that uh, people who knew Sonoma County, people who had heard of Sonoma County, whether they had been here or not, wanted to come to Sonoma County, and in large part because they wanted to support Sonoma County, as mentioned in, in the purchasing line and others, other entities. But from us, in a more organic tourism standpoint, they wanted to come to this place, and we are we are seeing that, and that's how we are messaging our advertising too, is to come back to this place that you know and you love, and it's been, I think, fairly successful. Uh, the other piece of research we did was local because, um, as as Senator McGuire mentioned, we have this odd complexity happening in the industry right now. The benchmarks that we generally use for success are hotel occupancy and a number of different inside baseball kinds of uh, measurements we use in, in tourism. But uh, those key hotels, which are primarily those along the 101 corridor and what we call flag hotels, those that are associated with the brand, are showing tremendous um, results. I mean, year over year, as was mentioned, we're up depending on the month, from 12 to 17 percent in our hotel occupancy. So one would look at that and say, well, everything's fine. Well, everything is, as you can imagine, not fine. So we also have started a program that, um, because in the second piece of research, we talked to the inns and the bed and breakfasts and the restaurants and the, the smaller entities that are outside of that 101 corridor and found that there was still tremendous pressure on business there. So we are starting a, a program that we are calling the Sonoma County Explorer, and this aims to get people out of the, out of that corridor. So at, there are several visitor centers throughout Sonoma County, and people will go to those visitor centers and get a stamp. This is a lot like a normal passport program, but you go to these visitor centers and get a stamp, and at the visitor center then they have um, a, you know, a list of the entities available in the area. There is also a fairly... Um, it's not a great detailed uh, map on the back, but but uh, with two stamps, you get a canvas bag, and we have these lovely Sonoma County canvas bags. And then uh, for every uh, every stamp you get, then you can enter into a trip to go, come back to Sonoma County. So the, the idea on this one is that it drives people out to those businesses that we know are, have not benefited from the... Um, evacuees, the FEMA workers, and the others that are occupying our hotels. It will be, it continues to be a complex issue. It will be um, a complex issue once this, these numbers start to uh, evaporate a little bit, but we are monitoring this all the time. This won't come as a surprise to anybody, and we are, we're constantly working to generate business, whether it be through group business or it be through um, individual travelers. I, you know, uh, I just came back from Australia. Lots of us are doing international travel. It's that time of the year for our big travel shows. 
And I was asked a lot about fires, and obviously Australians are very familiar with wildfires, and uh, it was always a great opportunity to dispel these myths. We also had people in Germany at another travel show, and they never got a question at all about the fires. So it really seems to depend on where in the world you are and what is happening at that time there. So uh, we continue to be very uh, cognizant about the issues that are, are impacting our business. I would say for the ask, and as, as everyone has probably mentioned, is housing. And from my standpoint, it's housing. And we continue to hear the stories of families who are frustrated by their interaction with insurance companies and with other entities that are helping them rebuild. And I tell you, we can say we're open for business, but when somebody comes to Sonoma County, they have to, inter it's the people that makes that experience special. And certainly we have extraordinary natural beauty and all of that, but it's that interaction. And when our people are exhausted and our people are frustrated, that's the experience our travelers remember. And that breaks my heart because Sonoma County, the spirit of Sonoma County, the creativity of our people, our tenacity and our resilience, that's what makes this place so extraordinary. And to not allow our visitors to see that is a shame. So I appreciate the time this morning and certainly will answer any questions. I know we, we had a short period of time, lots to talk about, but thank you. Well, thank you very much, Claudia. I, mean, it's a, um, I, I can't imagine taking on that job three weeks after the fire started. And, uh, it's pretty amazing. It looks like uh, to me that they got the right person for the job. Well done. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Clay Gregory, the uh, one and only president and CEO of Visit Napa Valley and a close personal friend. Clay, welcome. Thank you, Bill. Nice to be here. Um, a lot of the things that Claudia talked about are similar with uh, Napa Valley, so I'm not going to repeat those things. Um, but just to sort of augment what she talked about in terms of we did do a, a, a full-page ad together that went into the Chronicle, but also to the, um, uh, uh, um, what's the name of the paper here? Uh, the Press Democrat. Yeah, Democrat, thank you very much. And also uh, from uh, to uh, the register in Napa, and also to uh, Sacramento, and people have this feeling that uh, we hate each other as a destination, and it's just it's not true. And <laughs> Claudia um, put it very well, and I think it's it's kind of uh, an analogous to the wine industry. The wine industry actually works pretty well together, and it's the same thing in destination. Uh, marketing, and uh, we've always had a really good relationship, at least since we got started in the modern era of Visit Napa Valley. Um, so when the fires first started, and I'm not going to talk about any of the vineyard things, um, Garrett did that really well, um, but the very first uh, morning after the fires, we made a decision to uh, open our welcome center, which is a beautiful place, and some of the people thought it wouldn't make any sense, but it made tremendous sense because not only were there locals who didn't have power and who didn't know what was going on, but there were also many visitors in um, the valley. We actually got about 500 people per day for the first two days, and uh, it, was a, it was a boon for them to be able to have somebody to talk to uh, person to person. We also then got very involved with the, um, our uh, homepage on the website, was all about what was open, what's not open, what people can do, what people can't do. In, the, in, the, in that first week, most people just were ready to go as fast as they could, but that changed over um, a period of uh, weeks. Um, we, we were very involved with the government entities. We were very involved with the media. We were in very, very involved with all kinds of um, community relations organizations. Um, uh, the Napa Valley has an organization called the Napa Valley Community Organizations Active in Disaster. COAD is the easier way to think about it. And we have a person who's on that board. So she was very involved in that. They had meetings every single day to talk about what was happening and what uh, organizations could do to, to help. Um, in the, in the beginning, we decided that we could not, um, we had to be very conscious about when we were going to turn on the uh, open for business sign. Uh, and I, I'm sure you all remember, but about three years before this, we had the earthquake. 
With the earthquake, it was easy to say open for business because, especially from a tourism standpoint, the vast majority of the impact from the earthquake was in downtown Napa, including our, our building where our offices are, unfortunately. Um, but Trefethen was closed, and that was really the only winery that was impacted, and none of the hotel, well, a couple of hotels were uh, impacted by um, water from uh, fire sprinkler, sprinklers going off. But otherwise, it was the same thing as it ever was. And so we got to turn on open for business that time, probably the fourth day after it happened. And, um, but we weren't comfortable doing that this time, and it turned out that I think we we're on the right track, even though some of our partners uh, were very unhappy about the first uh, communication that we did in a, in a meaningful way, which was another um, full-size ad in those same papers that didn't say a word about coming back to the Napa Valley. It was all about supporting the um, first, uh, um, the people who came in first and helped everybody. It, it talked about people who lost their homes, ta talked about having sympathy, to people who, who were in the valley at the time, but it didn't say anything about coming to visit. And uh, we, we still think that was the right thing to do at the time. And I think if we look back and we see what happened a, a week or so later when the whole city of Calistoga got evacuated for three nights, it was definitely the right decision. Had we turned on the open for business um, sign uh, you know, two days earlier, Calistoga would have been uh, open for two days, and then it would have been evacuated. And so that would have been a horrible message to send to people. Um, and it was also very difficult for us to decide. Uh, we, we couldn't tell where the fires were going to go. The fire people couldn't tell where it was going to go. And we also couldn't tell what was going to happen with air quality. So uh, it ended up being 10, um, uh, about eight days after uh, that first meeting that we had with our board, and uh, we then went live with uh, Open for Business. We did another ad that was much more forward about coming to visit the Napa Valley. We even talked about the importance of tourism and how if people want to help, the best thing that they can do is to come and stay overnight. And it was at that about that same time, a couple of days later, that we uh, did the joint ad with Sonoma. And as Claudia said, um, it was an amazing uh, effort by Visit California to support all of us. Uh, they actually got about a million dollars from their board of directors uh, in extra funds to support the efforts around the fires. And then now they've been working with uh, Santa Barbara on the tragedies that they're having there. Um, but we couldn't thank them enough. And we, there's no way that we could have gotten our messaging out um, in the way that we were able to do that if it weren't for Visit California. Um, so we were thankful that we have them. Um, we, uh, we, we spent about 10% of our total marketing budget on uh, trying to start recovery in um, October, uh, which is uh, enormous for October because normally we wouldn't spend any money in October because September and October are all, always the two uh, most uh, positive um, months that we have. Uh, one of the things that was great and is very Napa Valley, and the same thing happens here, um, is that by the time we were a couple weeks into this on our website, not only did it still have things about what was open and what wasn't open and how you can help and how you can donate to what, what kind of community service you can get involved in, um, we also had over 40 fundraising um, events on our website uh, just about every week since uh, about two weeks into the fires. And so that raised a tremendous amount of money uh, and, and did really good for a whole bunch of people. We're in a little bit different if, to go into the data on um, how we're doing from a hotel and a tourism standpoint. Um, we did not, we were fortunate in not having as, as many um, people needing uh, to be evacuated as Sonoma did, certainly. And um, so uh, basically all of the evacuees were done in uh, hotels by about the middle of November. Um, and so if you look at our, our, our data uh, since October, October we were, we were down, this is total revenue for lodging, uh, we were down by 37%. Uh, and it's not funny, but I sort of have to laugh at it. If we didn't have a really good first, Octo first week of October, it would have been about 50% down. In November, we were off by 4.2% compared to last year. In December, we were actually up by 6.3%, and again, 
That's without any uh, of the crews from PG&E. They were all gone, and the um, evacuees were gone. January, we were up by 8.8%, which is really fantastic. In February, we were up again over the previous year by 5%. And I think part of that comes from exactly the same thing, again, that uh, Claudia talked about, is that we do, we do visitor profile studies every other year uh, so that we understand what people like best about the Napa Valley, what they would like to see enhanced, and on and on and on. And we do an economic impact of uh, tourism at the same time. And, and in fact, we're doing that right now. So we've a added some questions around the perceptions of the fires. Um, but um, what, uh, what, let's see, where was I going to go with that? The, oh, so um, even in, in spite of how well we're, we're doing and the fact that uh, we're, we're on, a, on a nice kind of upward um, road, what's happening is uh, around other parts of the country, like uh, Claudia did talk about, is that people still think that there are fires, especially on the East Coast, and um, there's, a, there's a magazine, well, there's an uh, a, a entity called MPI. I can only remember acronyms now. Um, but MPI uh, is a big group um, organization, and they also have a magazine. And so I got a call from them about, I would say it was probably middle of December. So the fires were long gone by that point. And this gentleman, he started off by talking about how, how little tourism uh, structures must be left at this point. And, and I was like, just, you know, I mean, by then, some really good stories had been run, uh, specifically that I can speak about at Napa Valley. The New York Times did a great story about how beautiful it still is, and the LA Times did the exact same thing. And this guy in, the, in tourism marketing and selling uh, thought that we basically had lost all of our hotels, that none of the wineries were open, and, and that he was serious. And so it, it's just, it's very frustrating and ha how difficult it is to get that out. So we just have to stay on that, stay on that, and stay on that. And regarding what, um, we, we're getting a lot of help actually, or the people who need it the most are getting a lot of help from the county, um, changes in permit processing. Uh, if folks who, who have homes in the county proper, then, um, and, they're, and they're destroyed, they can rebuild that um, with uh, uh, up to 20% uh, bigger and they get uh, a much more streamlined process to go through to get permitting for that, which has helped a ton. The other thing that we are hoping um, can change in a meaningful way is that the, the insurance company um, industry uh, really does not come across as a very um, helpful thing for consumers who have lost uh, incredible things uh, around their life, like their home. So, uh, and the county is also working on those things. So um, I think they're, they're trying their best to do things and to do it in a really rapid manner. Thank you very much. Thank you, Clay. Uh, now we have Shelby Sim, who is the president and CEO of Visit the San Inez Valley. We had the opportunity when we were down in our last uh, uh, joint committee on, a uh, select committee on wine, to visit the San Inez Valley. Very, very beautiful. And Take it away. Fantastic. Thank you. And, and uh, I just I can't tell you how much we appreciate sitting at the table with Napa and Sonoma. This is this is amazing to be to be here. Um, first of all, I need to thank the first responders and uh, for everything they did for uh, Santa Barbara County. Um, our fire was a lot more recent than uh, than Napa's. Uh, Napa's fire started and um, and we we all came together. We were all bought, buying uh, Napa wine. And uh, in fact, our Vintners Foundation board raised over thirty-five thousand dollars for for the effort for Napa and Sonoma. And then we got the fire, and then we got the largest fire in uh, California history, the largest uh, wildfire, uh, Thomas Fire. Um, we had no uh, direct damage in the Santinez Valley. In the Santinez Valley, that for those of you that don't know, is in the heart of Santa Barbara wine country. Uh, we're thirty-five minutes north of uh, Santa Barbara, and uh, so whereas we had no direct damage from the fires. Uh, nor did we have any loss of life from the mudslides as Santa Barbara did. We were uh, incredibly affected by the access to our area. Uh, when the mudslides hit, the, the 101 freeway was closed for two weeks, and we were empty. You know, uh, the city of Solvain, one of our six communities, uh, as we know, is a very popular, uh, you know, the Danish capital of America. You could have bowled on the middle of the street, and nobody would have known. Um, it, was, it was just devastating to us and the access. Um, once the freeway came back, 
Uh, and and uh, as uh, uh, my colleagues were saying, the Visit California really jumped on and, and, and has helped, uh, I would say, Santa Barbara proper quite a bit. Um, we still struggle to be recognized a, as part of that area that needs the, the assistance as well. Uh, so that, that's our challenge. Um, and then as everyone has spoke about, our biggest challenge now is PR. Um, you know, in, in, as a gentleman, Clay, Clay was saying in Napa, uh, about Napa, you know, Europe is still showing giant boulders and mudslides in Santa Barbara like it's happening still. Uh, we just had a rainstorm, you know, a week or so ago and every news station went back to showing the mudslide, you know, all those films and everything like it was going to happen. It never happened. Um, everybody canceled their hotel reservations. Um, there has been seven evacuations since the mudslides of Montecito, uh, whereas those folks, you know, were very sorry they've been displaced and, of course, the loss of life. But the freeway is open. It's open in both directions. And, and everybody just seems so excited to say that, oh, my gosh, they could close the freeway again. No, they aren't going to close it again. The freeway is open. We are open for business. Um, uh, one other thing I'd like to say is just that uh, uh, it's just the, it's back to the uh, stability uh, that we have. You know, we have recovered. Uh, again, as our colleagues have said, we've had some busy weekends. People are coming back, and we are getting good press. Um, but we have been told by Santa Barbara County Fire that for the next four or five years, uh, with any kind of rainstorm, there's that opportunity for mudslides. So there's that opportunity that we would lose access to our area. Uh, so it's about messaging. It's about, you know, making sure everyone knows that the freeway is open. Even if we have to evacuate, unfortunately, some folks, there's no danger of the freeway being closed. Perfect. Well, thank you very much. At this time, uh, what questions um, from the members? Thank you so much. Um, just a few questions. Um, Looking to the, the three of you, and then obviously uh, Ms. Comfort as well. So, what were you thinking? We would where when we were in the middle of these fires. Uh, what were you thinking the impact would be mm -hmm. compared to where we're at now? Meaning, did you think it was going to be worse? Do you th or do you think that we're better off than you thought? Would that's an open question to each of you uh, and your thoughts. Well, we, we for sure thought it was going to be worse than what it's been. Um, you know, and we've done, uh, oh, the w thing I, I w wrote um, right over was every year on uh, November 1st, we start what we call Cabernet season. And Cabernet season, um, it, we, I could make a joke about it, but I'm not going to. Um, it, it is what we call the, the quiet season that we have, and we call it Cabernet season because we don't get horrible weather, and but it is cooler, and so our chefs are making uh, heartier dishes that go best with our flagship wine, which is Cabernet. And so we already had all of the advertising in place for Cabernet season when uh, uh, November hit. And so we were able to do the, those advertisements on top of what we were already doing in uh, October. And, uh, and the other thing um, is that, what we talked about before and Claudia mentioned as well, is that people really love the Napa Valley, they love Sonoma, they love Na uh, um, the wine country in the whole state. Um, and I think we got that message out as quickly as we could that it, you're not going to even notice that there were fires here. And people um, started to show up. And, and, and you know, we, we targeted, which we normally don't do that, but we targeted um, the local um, communities, too. Because yeah, most of the co people who come from local communities don't stay overnight, and we like it if people stay overnight because the economic benefit is better. But we got a lot of people who did stay overnight, and they still came from the from the Bay Area. And I think it is because these these destinations are are valuable, and people want to come back after they've been and, and seen it. And this time, they wanted to come back to help. That's great. Thank you. Yeah, I just might add that I. It's complex. I don't know that it's better or worse than we would have, have expected. But the thing that is, I think, the most promising is that these the, the county and the impact of the fires on the county and the way our county operates is going to be beneficial for as long as we will know. Because the, the county's taken a, a kind of a renewed sense of innovation and of working more quickly of being more efficient. You know, they are now saying, you know, we can't continue to do business the way we've done it in the past because it's not going to work going into the future. There is no better way for a county 
to, to look forward than they are now. So I think from that standpoint, um, as a marketer, it's you always have to be looking forward. If you say we're going to do it the same way we've done it in the past, you're you're already sunk. So this this renewed innovation and and um, you know looking toward the future, we could not be in a better place. And before our uh, jumps in here, just Claudia, real quick. I mean, I, when we just take a look at uh, arrivals coming yeah. into Sonoma County Airport, uh, seventeen percent decrease the month of October. Right. That's really scary. Uh, and when, and the visitor numbers can are while uh, we have additional carriers coming in, mm -hmm. the numbers are strong. Uh, and you you have to be. I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, but when I'm taking a look at the numbers where I thought we potentially could have been mm -hmm. where we're at right now, they're surprisingly strong uh, after what we've gone through. They are surprisingly strong after what we've gone through. Um, I think we're seeing a lot. Uh, Big uptake in business travel and those coming in to service the issues that they need to service. I, I think that it's again it's complex because those are not our traditional tourists. They're different types of uh, visitors. Mm -hmm. So um, we're going to watch this as things sort of balance out. But um, there's there's no question that there the arrivals are great. We are getting from a funding standpoint. We have additional funds that we weren't expecting. So that gives us an opportunity just to get our message out even more strongly that we're open for business. So there are some, you know, that's a good thing for us as well. But it's it's still, as Carissa said, it, they, you know, there's it's a complex situation. Uh, some of those entities with great marketing muscle are doing well. The smaller entities really rely on us. So um, it, you know, it's, it's a complex issue. Uh, to answer your original question, during the height of the fires, from the wine perspective, we were very concerned that the impacts would be far broader, um, far more devastating, both to vineyards and to wineries than they've turned out to be. I think that it is a very important story to really focus on in terms of the the benefits of the vineyard serving as fire breaks across our communities, but also in terms of their, um, their resilience and their um, ability to resist the impact of fire themselves. So that was significant. We are still waiting to see what the actual results will be in terms of how the vineyards will be able to rejuvenate. However, we continue to be increasingly hopeful that those impacts will be less than originally expected. On the winery side, um, I think that's really a story of the incredible resilience, resourcefulness, and collaboration that we saw across the industry in terms of um, on an individual basis, neighbors helping neighbors, um, everything from growers letting other wineries and growers across their land to be able to get to wineries, um, wineries being able to share generators, to share manpower, keeping their, their vintage going in this incredibly stressful, dynamic, and challenging time really had an impact and helped helped preserve and protect the 2017 vintage for the most part. And then finally, I would say that and the, this is really a story of collaboration, um, not only on that individual basis, but I mean, we just heard Clay and Claudia talking about it, Carissa referenced it as well, but across the region, we saw partnership and collaboration at a level that we had not yet had the opportunity to experience. And I think that that is really a significant change across the wine industry that I hope we will foster and is something that gives us the opportunity to position ourselves better to deal with challenging situations in the future, but more importantly, to, to strengthen ourselves as an industry across the North Coast. We all know that all boats rise with a rising tide. The more that we can do together to support our tourism, our vintners, our growers, will ultimately result in not only a stronger wine industry, but a stronger, more vital, and more vibrant community for all of us. No, thank you. And I'll make it very quick, Mr. Chair, and thank you for the answers and turn right over to similar one. But I, I think the other item that we're, we're going to be challenged with is on the government side, with the loss of hotels in Santa Rosa, uh, the impact of the loss of bed tax will have on city services. Um, and would like to be able to see if you think we're going to make that up with a better off-season 
uh, because of the unique circumstance that we have with families and the workers into the rooms. So just your thought on that. Have you heard that each of the hotels are going to rebuild? And then my last piece is, are you changing the way you invest this year uh, to be able to market wine country? Uh, are you investing more resources? Um, obviously, you're talking about we're open for business, but if you could quickly touch on those items. Uh, certainly. So the loss, there were three hotels that were lost. Um, the Hilton was the largest of the hotels, and that was uh, also a big meeting hotel, so there's convention dollars that are spent there. But at the same time, additional hotels opened, uh, and yes, there was a loss in rooms, but it balanced so we are now at the same level of hotel rooms that we were as we were prior to the fires and there is a number there's a thousand rooms on the books um, in various stages of development through the next couple of years so um, not the same large meeting type hotels so that all of those meetings were displaced they were replaced I should say in other in other properties uh, but we are seeing good growth and s remaining strong interest from hotel developers to come to Sonoma County, which is great news. And how about rebuild? Have you heard uh, about each of the properties? Uh, I, I had, don't have a direct line to any of those properties, I'm sorry to say, but I have, um, I have heard more promising thoughts from the Fountain Grove than the, other, than the Hilton. I am not sure what the Hilton folks are doing. If anybody has the inside scoop, I'd love that, but I haven't heard that. In, uh, enhance investment and change, yeah. uh, please. Yes. Yeah. So um, the Sonoma County Tourism Board uh, had uh, gave us a, an additional 700, 500,000 to 750 for the year to invest in specifically fire-related um, marketing, which we are doing. And I uh, Always, we are we are um, continuing to talk, uh, show images of Sonoma County now, so people know that we aren't showing, you know, 1975 pictures of beautiful Sonoma County. That the post-fire imagery is going up. We are going to be uh, launching a new brand in the summer. We'll have a television commercial that go along with that, so that will significantly increase the awareness and the um, the knowledge of, of Sonoma County today. Assembly member, questions? Sure. Um, thank you very much for all your testimony. Um, first, I want to just um, I want to I, uh, acknowledge Claudia's comment about um, the people in the tourism industry and that, yes, it's coming back, but the people are still affected by their housing issues, their insurance issues. Um, and I, I just want to say is that be assured we're working really hard on that. And I know that we have a wonderful team here and others throughout the state are trying to make sure that we can help those individuals and our constituents that don't, um, are really struggling. And um, it is a lot. When you see someone's face and you can still tell deep down there's a lot going on. And I think we have identified that there's a lot of people that really do have PTSD after this, including the fire responders. So um, I, I want to acknowledge the fact of that, that we are working on some insurance uh, issues. But isn't it a shame is that we have to have an issue like this to come about and then we're just dealing with some, all kinds of rules and policies that should have been changed, maybe back as far as when we had the Oakland fires. And um, some of those things could have been changed then. So I, I want to just assure you that, you know, we're here for a while, hopefully. We don't get reelected, but we're here for a while, right? And to help push those um, ideas through through implementation and making sure there's oversight and making sure those things are done for all of us throughout the state of California, I think it's really important. And I want to acknowledge also for me from Southern California is that um, we had our committee hearing days, uh, just like weeks before the fires broke out there. I hope that wasn't bad karma, but nevertheless, because we talked about what the fires had done up here and that the leadership that you have down in your area, I really respect the fact that First thing they did was call many of us and said, "How? What do we do? What's the first thing we do?" And some of the simple things, but we forget about, is making sure we do translation. Um, some of the information that we had to make sure our communication went out in multiple languages. But when you're going through a crisis, you sometimes forget that, and it shouldn't be forgotten. So, um, uh, thank you very much. And also, my last question is for Honor. What is? Um, do you have any da data from Lake County because they had fires three years ago? And I know there's t people, it used to be a lot of tourism there, and it seems as though after the fires that went through there, it hit the industry, but also hit uh, tourism all the way around. 
Uh, yes, thank you. So we did include Lake County in our data collection, um, and we con we collaborated directly with the agricultural commissioner up there, as well as their wine grower and winery organizations. Um, and yeah, one of the first comments that I received from any of the growers or vintners up there was um, that they were still recovering from two years ago. Mm -hmm. However, they also said they'd learned a lot of lessons from their experience two years prior. Um, and the, the, these fires did not impact them from in terms of the wine industry as directly. It was much more in terms of personal property. And they're still struggling from a tourism perspective. And they have found it to be, and, and their tourism industry is, is nascent. It's just, um, they're, they're just cultivating it. And um, so they have not had as many resources, as much support to put again, against it in terms of revitalizing it following those fires. But this, um, the comment that I heard was that it just put them back to where they had been before. Thank you very much. So one final question. Um, you know, the press has kind of taken a couple hits today during the conversation. You know, as, as, as I look at this, uh, the press's responsibility really is reporting and reporting uh, uh, to try to get facts to people of, of the dangers involved. I'm not an apologist for the press, but it, it seems to me that uh, they did a phenomenal job during uh, these fires and at least getting the word out. But some of the negative aspects of that, it doesn't have to be here, it can be anywhere, you know, in the world, are people... People that read that don't read the next article or the next article, as, as Clay kind of pointed out to somebody from, from New York who called him. I guess in, in large, what I'm, I'm wondering is, is in, a yes or no is fine because we got to get moving here. But on your follow-up stories that you try to get to the press, are they more co are they cooperative with you in trying to get these words out and understanding? Can, can I speak to that yeah. very briefly? Yes, um, I would say emphatically yes. There's been um, extreme interest from the media in terms of some of the work that we've done, the facts that we've shared, and wanting to share that follow-up story. And I do just want to say that during the fires, they were scrambling to get any information that they could. And that was a part of the entire problem, was the lack of communication, the communication infrastructure that went down, and the inability of getting correct facts um, in order to report on them. So um, from our perspective, they have been continuing to tell the story. They reach out to us now that we're at the six-month mark. There's a, a, a whole other wave of interest in terms of wanting to find out what the story is today and correcting how it was originally reported. But that's from our perspective. Real quickly, I just uh, talked to a um, journalist in the Bay Area. And all she wanted to talk about was the, the positive part about what has gone on and, and how things are going. But the, the, I won't mention any names, but it just killed me and our colleagues that on the front page of one of the major um, uh, newspapers in the Bay Area, six days in a row on the at the top of the front, above the fold, as they say, was a fire that looked like the whole world was going up in flames. Six days in a row. And there was a lot of other things going on besides that. Well, thank you all. As, as usual, this is uh, always a hot topic. Uh, as the chair of this round, I didn't do a very good job since we're 50 minutes uh, past the, 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 the time allocated to this. But I think that shows what a great job the panel did. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you. Okay, with that, we'll move ahead to our uh, panel three, water supply. And I'm excited to hear what we have with our speakers today um, and what they're going to be sharing. Uh, it wasn't that long ago when we did our very first uh, uh, wine committee meeting, we talked about sustainability, and it's really um, sparked some interest for me. Um, we're looking at different things throughout the state regarding healthy soils, uh, California Climate and Ag Network uh, for climate change. We're looking at the Ag Land Trust. We're looking at SWEEP, which is the state water efficiency uh, that provides uh, money for assistance for farmers uh, and grants to help reduce greenhouse gases. So I'm looking forward to the conversation today. So first of all, I'd like to introduce the four panelists. Uh, Glenn McCorty, uh, Viticulture and Plant Science Advisor at Mendocino County for UC Cooperative Extension. We have Dr. Michael Anderson from California State uh, Climatologist at the Department of Water Resources. 
Eric Larson with the Environmental Program Manager for the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, and Katie Jackson, Vice President of External Affairs of Sustainability at Jackson Family Wines. Welcome all, and if Glenn, would, if you'd like to start, thank you. Well, good morning. It's an honor to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, so the University of California actually has a lot of researchers working on issues associated with water and watersheds uh, on, on three, at least three campuses. That would be UC Davis, UC Berkeley, and UC Riverside. And we're all connected together in the Division of Agriculture and Natural Resources. And then uh, UC Cooperative Extension, who I work for, our mission is to take that information and bring it to the grower level and make sense of what's going on. Uh, the research varies from the molecular level, so we have people who are working on, on how do genes turn off and on, how does it affect uh, mechanisms in the plant when things are dry or warm, uh, to outer space where we're doing remote sensing of what's happening uh, via satellites and everything in between. And I tried to pick a suite of things that might be interesting to you because uh, some are, are ready for prime time and other things are still working on. So uh, the, the first thing I, I want to mention is surface renewal technology. And th this is a way of sensing uh, evapotranspiration in a vineyard. And evapotranspiration basically is the uh, loss of water from the soil uh, because of the climate as well as by plant use. And uh, this surface renewal technology uses sensors in the soil and above the plant canopy to actually look at air movement and humidity in the air and then using a very elaborate algorithm tells you exactly how much water is being lost from the vineyard and by evapotranspiration. So it's very specific to a site. Most of our other approaches to doing evapotranspiration measurements involve weather stations, and then you have to interpret that with a crop coefficient and calculate it and, you know, kind of by gosh and by golly, figure out how much irrigation you need to do, whereas this technology actually can very specifically tell you what's going on in your vineyard and knowing what the uh, soil moisture storage is, it tells you how much to irrigate. And it's being offered now as a service. Uh, it's been licensed and patented through Thule Technologies, and they actually send you uh, an, an email, or you can log on with your smartphone or your computer and actually get a recommendation for how much should you water this week or today or whatever you want, whatever inter interval you want. So it's a, a very, very efficient way of using water and we figured that we could save at least between 50 to 100,000 gallons of water per acre uh, using this technology here on the North Coast. This is significant because we have multiple uh, stakeholders in our, in our surface water supplies like the Russian River. Uh, so it's, we're asking the Russian River to do a lot of things for us. First of all, we're asking it to be uh, a natural ecosystem for, for fish and for wildlife. We're asking it to convey water from Mendocino County down to Marin. Uh, we're asking it to supply agriculture. We're asking it to supply uh, residential uh, and business community stakeholders. So uh, the more efficient that we get with water and agriculture, the better off we are to be able to share water with other purposes. So the, the two professors who've been working on this is uh, Andrew McElrone and, and Rick Snyder, uh, who are both uh, involved in, in uh, soil moisture plant relations and uh, it, I, I'm pretty impressed with what it what it means. It's not widely implemented yet, but I see this is something that'll be pretty standard procedures in the future. Okay, so going next is a specialty crop uh, block grant that we got for climate beneficial vineyard management practices. We have a new concept of soil health. In the past, we always talked about soil quality as being uh, important to the vineyard, and that basically said, okay, what does a plant need to grow well? And we've changed that, that discussion a little bit probably in the last 10 years to talk a little bit more about soil health. Uh, soil health takes on also the context of what's going on in the environment. So what are we doing for the watershed? What are we doing for uh, uh, balancing carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and soil? And it takes on a little bit more of an ecological meaning as, as well as what's good for the vines. So. It turns out the technology behind this is fairly simple but not widely implemented. Basically, what we'd like to do is keep our soils covered as much as possible. Soils very much like your skin. When you expose it to the sun, you're doing damage. You're losing organic matter. You're setting yourself up for erosion because a bare soil uh, has reduced infiltration by as much as 60%, whereas if it's covered, by comparison, you may increase the infiltration rates 
200% compared to a bare soil. Uh, a lot of people like the look of tilled soil. You go to the Napa Valley, you see a lot of really beautifully tilled soil and not a weed in sight. And you come up into Mendocino County where I've been, and I've been really pushing this issue, we see a lot more covered soil and it's not as tidy, but it certainly is very good for the uh, infiltration of water and water storage. And additionally, we're sequestering carbon. We're taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and putting it into the ground. So we figure that with 1% increase of soil organic matter, which is pretty doable in about two to three years, uh, we can hold as much as 38,000 more gallons per acre uh, and also reduce water use at the same time because we don't get as much evaporation out of the water uh, soil. We're getting a mulching effect. Uh, so using compost and cover crops, we're working with growers to try to introduce the idea of soil health. And it's a, a North Coast effort. We're doing it in uh, Mendocino, Napa, and Sonoma counties through the RCDs and the, the Natural Resource Conservation Services and partners. And, uh, Professor David Smart at UC Davis, who works a lot on soil uh, organic matter and chemistry issues, and myself, uh, Carol Mandel from NRCS, and Erica Lundquist are our principal partners. Another uh, research project I'm working on is trying to control ice nucleating bacteria in vineyards. So uh, we use a lot of water for frost protection when we have frost events, particularly in Mendocino County, which is colder than, than Napa and Sonoma because uh, we're higher elevation and further north. And uh, every time we turn on the sprinklers to frost protect in Mendocino County, we use 400 acre feet of water, which is a fair amount of water. Uh, so we're looking for ways to not have to turn that on. And one of the things that we know is that at the center of every ice crystal is a little uh, ice nucleating bacteria that uh, basically sets the, uh, the formation of, of ice crystals. And if we don't have any of these bacteria on uh, grape tissue, we can have grape tissue go down to 26 degrees without injury. So experimentally, we're trying to control the ice nucleating bacteria two ways. One is by using uh, copper sprays, which will kill the bacteria. And uh, the other way to do it is to put in competing bac bacteria that wouldn't allow the ice nucleators to grow. So we're, I'm working with Dr. Steve Lindau from UC Berkeley on this, and we're in our second years of testing. And like most of the time, whenever I work on disease, pests, and other conditions. If I have a plague I want to study, it doesn't show up. So uh, last year, we didn't get any, any frost in Mendocino County, which made the growers very happy, but the researchers not so much. But we're able to simulate freezing in, in the laboratory, and we found by using this technique and approach, we were able to uh, protect grape tissue by as much as uh, three degrees below freezing uh, temperatures. And so we, we have high hopes for this. The last thing I want to talk about is rootstock breeding. So most of the rootstocks that are used in the wine grape industry, as you know, wine grapes are, are grafted uh, plants. They have a scion, which is the, the, the variety, like Chardonnay or Cabernet, and then they get grown on a rootstock. Most of the rootstocks that we use were developed over 150 years ago in France and Europe, uh, primarily to a, a work with a, a insect control an insect pest called phylloxera. So since that time, we really haven't upgraded our rootstocks very much, but Dr. Andy Walker is working on it to also address some other issues such as nematodes, which are very serious pests and, uh, and soil borne that attack uh, grapevine roots. And uh, kind of a subsidiary to breeding is that we're, he and I both believe we need to make our, our vineyards more uh, drought tolerant, primarily by uh, making them able to grow under drier conditions. And that's what we're trying to do. And uh, in, a, in addition to having uh, nematode and other pest resistance, they're also more drought tolerant because they're more vigorous. They're using genetics that come from the southwest of the uh, United States, from Texas, Arizona, and Mexico. And uh, he's having some success. It's a long-term project. It takes a generation, really, to, to breed these. So anyway, that's, that's just a real thumbnail sketch of some of the things that we're doing. I want you to know we're totally committed to, to uh, trying to improve the water efficiency of agriculture across all commodities, not just wine grapes in our state, because we recognize uh, you know, we're a semi-desert, uh, and we're really dependent on water to make things grow. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Do you have any questions yet? Dr. Anderson, would you like to start? All right. Thank you for having me. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about what the department's doing and some of the activities that we have here in the Bay Area. Uh, related to some of our more innovative projects. 
So water shows up in California in great bursts, uh, today being a nice object example of that with atmospheric rivers. Uh, they account for 40 to 60 percent of the annual precip, which can happen in a matter of a couple weeks over the whole winter season. Uh, year to year, highly variable. Some years nothing shows up, other years uh, a plenty, uh, given last year and the past five years as a significant example of that. To deal with that, uh, we're looking at opportunities in new observation techniques, uh, both uh, ground-based, airborne, and remote sensing. To do that, we work with uh, federal, state, and local partners uh, to not only identify the information to observe, but to leverage that information to make sure it, it's useful. And so we have partnerships with uh, NASA, NOAA, uh, the U.S. Geological Survey, Bureau of Reclamation on our federal partner side. Uh, local partners, Sonoma County Water Agency has been a uh, big help in some activities here of late that I'll get into in a minute. Coupled with the observations are forecasts. Uh, because water arrives in great bursts, it's the ability to manage that volume of water uh, to manage a volume given more time, you have more ability to plan, prepare, and make use of that water when it does show up. And then pulling those two lines of information into a decision support tool that enables a water user to make the best use of that information. And so some examples of these projects include um, not necessarily local to the Bay Area immediately, but is the Airborne Snow Observatory. Uh, which is a partnership with NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab, and a part from Na an office from NASA's headquarters called the Western Water Applications Office. This is a new office that NASA has opened recently, located at JPL in Pasadena, for the express purpose of improving their ability to take their science and move it to operations, recognizing that that's a process and not just a singular handoff. What was the name of again? Western Waters Applications Office. So with uh, then NOAA, and this is more directly in the Bay Area, we have spent the last decade with the Earth Systems Research Lab working on a project called the Hydrometeorological Testbed, which looks at some advanced observing systems for atmospheric rivers. And we have uh, snow level radar, uh, which are a vertically pointing radar that look to find where the rain turns to snow. It's a key element to flood management as these storms hit the Sierra. Uh, we have what we call our atmospheric river observatories, which is a wind profiler, which gives the structure of the winds through the height of the atmosphere, as well as a sensor called the GPS Met. So we have GPS stations that are used uh, to monitor the land surface in California. We couple that with some meteorological instrumentation. It improves the GPS signal but also gives us how much water vapor is in the atmosphere and makes a nice coupling to the satellite imagery that only works when water is a lower boundary. So with these instrumentations, we have a much better view of atmospheric rivers as they work across the landscape. We get a better understanding of how water interacts with the topography. A building on that effort is a project through the Integrated Regional Water Management Program, and um, the Bay Area region went collectively on the last proposal. Instead of doing competing proposals, they all went in together on a single project, four years, $19 million, called the Advanced Quantitative Precipitation Information Project. And the idea is to invest in some advanced observing instrumentation, including some gap-filling radars. The big Doppler radars that the National Weather Service relies on were built for the Great Plains. Uh, the challenge in the Bay Area is topography. There's hills that get in the way, block beams, and so it doesn't look like it's raining hard when in actuality it is. So in this effort, we're going to put in radar that give a better sense of that, improving upon the detail of understanding how rain's moving across, and then trying to develop decision support tools that benefit not only water management, transportation emergency response. 
And so looking forward to building on how that effort goes and seeing how then that can be transferred uh, to other regions in the state. It's exciting information because obviously the technology is moving us in the direction we need to go. So thank you very much. Yep. Mr. Larson, welcome. Thank you. I just want to express our appreciation. The department appreciates the select subcommittees of the Senate and the Assembly for having the department here today for this important discussion. Um, and, you know, it's always interesting talking about water issues when it's pouring rain outside. We found this uh, to be true when we ever, during the recent drought, when we scheduled uh, public meetings on drought issues, it always rained. And uh, so, uh, you know, we might get through this and never have a drought again if you keep scheduling these meetings. Uh, I want to take us in a little bit of a different direction um, in that uh, we've been talking today sort of about the effects of the fire and effects of water on tourism and on the wine industry. Uh, but there was also a profound effect on uh, fish and wildlife. Uh, habitat issues within uh, the fire region and, and also continues to be within the agriculture areas that are used for vineyard culture. Um, you know, we, we've talked about how um, the, uh, the effects of the fire had within uh, what we consider to be the, the Napa Valley or the, the Sonoma Valley where the wine grape growers really have the most visual effects when you see these aerial views, you see these long stretches, the valleys. And those are the main stems of uh, the Russian River or the Napa River. And, and you get into the Central Valley wine growing areas, you have the San Joaquin River as well. Those are the main stems. But from a fish and wildlife perspective, although those are, those are important areas, it's the upslope areas, the tributaries, that are uh, of significant importance. And in the Sonoma Valley, as well as in uh, the Napa Valley, um, the wine grape growers also occupy those tributary areas. And that's where the water supply comes from that provides, notwithstanding the dams, uh, but provides water that feeds those streams, provides for fish and wildlife habitat. Uh, and so we focused in the past drought, our drought initiatives, in offering opportunities uh, to keep water within the streams uh, that were important. Uh, we had what we call the voluntary drought initiatives. Uh, and we uh, worked with, uh, not to steal any of uh, uh, Jackson uh, family wineries thunder in your conversation, but we worked with various uh, wine industry representatives to, uh, to use water supply that was captured during the winter months and held in ponds to put back into the stream during the summer months. And we're offering those same opportunities, uh, albeit without the governor's proclamation uh, of a drought emergency, to offer incentives uh, through our uh, rapid permitting process, uh, through coverage, through um, our MOU process for uh, potential take of listed species, to, uh, to what we do what we call stream uh, water augmentation. Uh, take that water that was captured during the winter months or uh, Either, even captured uh, by well water and put back into the streams to provide summer rearing habitat for the important fish species that we have in our watersheds. Uh, what's unique uh, and different from the main stem is that uh, steelhead trout, uh, coho salmon, utilize the upstream areas uh, for rearing habitat during the summer months. Uh, they need to stay in the stream for a year uh, so we need to make sure that there's cold, clear, running water during the summer months as well. And uh, the appropriation of water for irrigation, uh, also for some domestic uses, uh, has reduced the amount of water that's available in those watersheds, uh, working with uh, the industry to uh, and other individual landowners to put water back into the streams has been real helpful for us to, uh, to ensure that that habitat is, uh, remains. Um, what we have now, as opposed to the emergency proclamation, is our ability to move through the permitting process quickly uh, when we get requests and to uh, to make approvals of uh, augmentation of those stream flows. Uh, Glenn also mentioned um, uh, water that's utilized uh, during the springtime months for um, for frost protection, and that's a big issue for us as well uh, for fish and wildlife concerns. I was driving uh, through uh, wine country uh, in mid-February, and we hadn't had a lick of rain in a couple weeks. 
and it didn't seem like we were going to have any more for another couple of weeks at least. And uh, at the same time, I'm looking around and seeing uh, the, the fruit tree starting to bloom, and I realized that we were also going to be looking at bud break in the vineyards and thinking, wow, we, you know, we're at a, at a real low period in our stream flows, and at the same time that's occurring, we're seeing uh, the need to start turning irrigation systems on for frost protection. And that became a real concern for us at that time. Fortunately, March came around and we had a, another March miracle. Uh, we're probably not quite at, you know, back to normal, but this storm will really help us getting there. But we need to start looking at how do we approach these water uses, both summertime irrigation and the springtime frost protection, in a way that uh, provides protection for the fish species that are so vital to, uh, to you know, our tourism industry here and, and our natural resources that, you know, are just part of what Sonoma County, Napa County are, um, and at the same time provide for the industrial need uh, within, uh, you know, both, the, as uh, Senator McGuire mentioned, the 600,000 people using water from our watersheds, uh, as well as um, uh, for, um, uh, uh, for irrigation purposes in the upslope that, that is uh, outside of the water conveyance system. And those opportunities are there. We've uh, promoted uh, changing uh, a lot of the uh, winter, springtime irrigation systems for frost protection over to fan protection. We've encouraged offspring water storage during the winter months, and we'll work with, uh, with the industry to uh, enable that to happen, getting the permits for storage instead of riparian use, uh, switching over to stored use. Uh, the opportunities are there, and we have mechanisms in place to make that happen quickly and effectively. Uh, we appreciate the, uh, the folks both from Jackson Family Wine as well as Gallo that have worked with us to implement um, augmentation of, of water during the summertime, as well as many of the uh, local vineyards that have switched over to fan uh, systems as opposed to irrigation system, as well as off storage, off-site storage or off-stream st uh, storage. We have funding through uh, what we call the Fishery Restoration Grant Program, uh, Prop 1, uh, program and uh, as well to to enable some of those things to take effect and uh, we look to forward to continually working within the industry to do that yes go ahead. You, know, you, you made a point about uh, your cooperating with uh, on off stream storage you know um, in 2002 uh, then assembly member Huffman uh, had a bill that would allow for off-stream, you know, development of, uh, of of storage, and two years ago, I think it was, in this in, or in this committee, maybe it was even three years ago when I was in the state assembly, we had a, a select committee on wine, and the whole one of the whole purpose of the uh, of the outcomes of that was for us to get a little bit more aggressive and work with water resources and fish and wildlife, because it hasn't worked. It hasn't worked at all. So I run a bill, and, and I don't want to shoot the messengers. I'm really glad you guys are here. This is not an adversarial thing. But, you know, I'm, I'm pretty frustrated to hear that because my bill went nowhere because between your two departments, the cost of doing something for the North Coast in storage was over a million dollars. And it just seemed like it was a contest between the two organizations. And I, I guess my takeaway here today is, it sounds to me like you wonder, we have an atmospheric river that's coming through here, yet all the water is going down the Russian River, it's going down the Napa River, and it's going, it's going out never to be uh, used again. So I hope that we can find a way to uh, collaborate to be able to uh, see through uh, Senator then Assemblymember Huffman's you know, vision for the North Coast and my vision for the, for the North Coast in terms of, of water storage. Yeah, I mean, it's just... I I I really like you to, and maybe you don't feel like you can. I've talked to both of the directors of your, of your respective departments, but it's it's very frustrating. Well, as I said, we do, we do encourage off-stream storage. Uh, right now, we see a lot of uh, direct appropriation, whether it's from groundwater that's hydrologically connected to the streams or from direct pumping from the streams. And so, the opportunity to get off-stream is something that we really do promote. Uh, and to do wintertime storage of that water. It offers everything from summer irrigation opportunities to fire protection uh, uh, reservoirs, 
uh, to the ability to utilize those, uh, that source during the uh, springtime for frost protection. So we do encourage that. I do understand that there is uh, a, uh, a process that has to be followed, um, particularly in changing from riparian to stored water, and which requires a, a, a permit through uh, the uh, water resources. Uh, the uh, board of uh, the state board, we call it, the uh, Department of Water Resources, to um, to initiate that, and that can be long term as far as the, how long it takes to get that. But we are willing to walk through that. We see it as an environmental benefit. Uh, in, in, in that, I, I would like our delegation. Let's not do this here to be able to meet with you and sit down and see what we can do to get something done on it. Because what you're saying is not what's in practice in the watersheds that we have here. So I, I'd, I'd love to use that as an invitation to get together and have some uh, uh, dialogue on that to see what we can do to make it better in the future. But I appreciate your time, and, yeah. and thanks for the information. Just, just so when we're on this, I think where uh, Senator Member Huffman was going was, as you all know, had a portion of the bill uh, that was implemented. And then there were going to be further steps that would promote off-stream storage. Uh, that would provide exactly what Mr. Larson uh, had just discussed, that cold water uh, during critical times of the year. Uh, and if Sonoma County had enhanced off-stream storage uh, capability, particularly uh, several years ago when we had those frost-related events and those fish kills, uh, I think that could have been uh, potentially, uh, particularly here in northern Sonoma County, avoided. And uh, again, I, I think it's uh, when we say you are royal, you right the organization yeah, of. Um, sure. But I think the bottom line You'd is. You'd be this. surprised how directly involved I am. There we go. <laughs> well, all right. Then but not, Lord, not, not, not in a negative way. I'm promoting this. That's all. Uh, all of a sudden, it got awkward. Uh, no, I'm kidding. So he, here's, I think, our piece. Mendocino County has advanced a, a, an initiative, and they've become very aggressive in regards to off-stream storage. Um, and it has become common practice uh, within the viticulture industry. We have some uh, enhanced uh, impaired streams, particularly in northern Sonoma County, that off-stream storage would be a benefit. With the understanding that we need to be uh, cautious uh, on any strandings or uh, potential fish kill, the common sense approach would be taking that sheet flow during peak winter months, storing it, uh, whether it's for frost or for direct irrigation later in the year or in the fall. And so I think that, uh, and I think we all know in this room, this has been an issue that's been discussed for probably greater part of a decade now, and very little traction has been gained. Um, and if this is uh, an initiative that the departments would like to be able to see, industry would like to be able to see, and I think uh, the delegation would like to be able to see, there has to be a way to be able to expedite um, uh, whether it is the approval process or at least a plan uh, to be able to help this industry uh, achieve what they want to, and that is making sure that it's fish friendly and water efficient. So I, I fully support uh, Senator Dodd, and both of these two have been leaders on this, uh, on being able to bring this all together, because I think that would be good. I don't know if any of you. So if you don't. Um, if you don't mind, we're going to move on, and uh, we're going to introduce Kate Jackson, and she's the Vice President of External Affairs and Sustainability at the Jackson Family Wines. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Um, uh, so um, I'm uh, Vice President of Sustainability at my family's winery, um, and we also have our Director of Sustainability, Julian Gerbeau, here today, um, who manages a lot of the projects I'm going to be talking about. So if there are any really detailed questions that I can't answer, he's um, going to support. <laughs> um, anyway, um, I've been asked to share with the committee uh, how Jackson Family Wines is responding to the um, challenges of climate change. Um, as farmers, um, my family has always understood that access to water is um, something that is uh, critical to the livelihood of our business and um, that it will continue to challenge our agricultural community um, going into the future. So this is something that um, we take very seriously. Um, my parents um, founded the business, and um, from the beginning, they were very forward-thinking in terms of um, wanting it to be multi-generational and um, 
They understood that taking care of the environment was a critical part of um, long-term viability of the business. And so um, uh, as regards to water especially, um, we were looking at that from the very beginning. Um, since then, um, we've also looked at things such as energy management and reducing our carbon emissions as um, things that are also critically important to um, helping uh, with climate change issues. Um, some of the things that we've done uh, um, that um, I'm proud of are um, that um, in uh, 2011, we gifted um, a donation to UC Davis to help their campus's winery and brewery um, achieve LEED Platinum certification and then to um, have it um, continue um, and become um, even more um, sustainable by becoming a net zero water, energy, and waste um, building. Um, the Justice Jackson Sustainable Winery building is there now, and it serves as the testing ground for testing new technologies that will reduce winemaking's footprint on the environment. Um, this collaboration also serves as a model for future winery construction for um, those in the industry and also um, for my family. Um, uh, we've also um, looked at how we can reduce um, our water use in our winemaking practices. Um, and in practice, since 2008, when we started benchmarking how much water we use in our wineries, um, we've reduced the number of gallons of water it takes um, to produce a gallon of wine by 57%. Um, today, that is about twice as um, water efficient as the industry average. Um, our largest source of winery water usage is in our cooling towers that run our refrigeration system. So we've um, really made an effort to tackle that area. Um, and over the last few years, we have utilized empty fermentation tanks to store rainwater um, collected from our, our rooftops for reuse in our cooling towers. Um, this has enabled us to offset groundwater usage for um, their operation um, for nearly six months out of the year. So that's something that, um, that has been working very well. Um, the second largest source of water usage in many of our wineries is the barrel washing process. Um, and as a result, we have developed barrel wash water recycling and heat recapture systems to reduce um, or to reuse water and reduce um, the water usage in barrel washing um, by up to 80%. Um, we're continuing to trial um, those um, uh, on a greater basis throughout our organization and um, hoping that that will help us um, continue to meet our goals. Um, of um, reducing our water usage further. Um, our latest innovation trial is called VSEP. Um, it's an acronym that's short for Vibratory Shear Enhanced Processing. Um, and this is something we'll be implementing later this year. Um, uh, it's a reverse osmosis membrane used for treating processed water. Um, the membranes vibrate at a high speed and they separate water molecules, um, removing impurities and bringing processed water back to drinking water standards. Um, we have partnered with UC Davis and the California Energy Commission to insta install um, one of these units um, to capture and reuse barrel wash water, um, hopefully up to 10 times. Um, and the potential is to save over 1.4 million gallons of water annually um, with that system. So um, when that goes in, um, in May, we'll, we're excited to start our trial and, um, and see that hopefully in practice. Um, we have also pioneered the introduction of UV tank sanitation technology. Um, we are the first uh, winery to deploy a commercial scale unit, and we now have units at six of our wineries. Uh, this, um, these units are wonderful because they save us um, over 300 gallons per tank sanitation cycle. So um, that really um, reduces the water used in the um, sanitation process in, in winemaking, um, which is critical to quality. Um, Similarly, we have worked to making progress in our vineyards. Uh, to com contribute to sustainable groundwater levels, we are collaborating um, with the resource agencies and Dr. Philip Bashand to implement a UC Davis developed recharge, um, groundwater recharge program um, uh, because recharging aquifers in California is critical to reliable water supply. Uh, our first um, trial uh, to advance the water recharge um, uh, program was implemented last year and of course, um, uh, um, I was laughing at uh, Glenn's comment earlier about um, the, how trial, um, trials typically are put in when the weather doesn't cooperate. We got so much water that it really um, kind of overwhelmed our trial, um, uh, which we weren't expecting. Um, uh, how it works is groundwater recharge work, works by diverting peak flows during storm events and then flood irrigating the vineyards during the vine's dormant, system, or dormant season, and that recharges the aquifer. 
Um, our first year trial indicated that we can recharge well above water use in our vineyard, so that's exciting. Um, we're currently working with other farmers here in Sonoma County to develop a regional recharge program uh, that we're hoping will make a positive contribution to the county's groundwater management program. Um, to address the challenges around frost water use and stream stage ne needed for uh, fishery protection, um, we worked with the Natural Resource Conservation District and other growers to purchase and install wind machines to meet many of the regional um, growers' needs. Um, this was something um, that Eric just uh, referenced. Um, this program has reduced our water use in the vineyards where we're using them by up to 50%. Um, we've also leveraged sap flow monitoring technology um, that allows the plant to indicate when it needs water. Um, and that tech has reduced our water usage um, for vineyard irrigation by up to 80% in some areas. Um, uh, in 2017, we received a grant through the Healthy Soils Program, um, which um, Glenn mentioned. Um, and we're exploring the impacts of reduced tillage and site-specific cover crops, um, as well as the application of compost to our vineyards. And um, it's going to be a five-year project. Um, we're kicking it off this spring in partnership with the Sonoma RCD and um, CDFA. And we're looking at how we can increase organic matter and water holding capacity in our soils, um, and also how we can sequester carbon um, by doing that. Um, and that's something that we think um, has a lot of potential and we're very excited about. Um, uh, during the 2015 drought, um, we worked with Trout Unlimited, um, National Marine Fisheries, Regional Water, and CDFW um, to provide reservoir water um, to put into a local tributary that was um, severely impacted by the drought, which was Green Valley Creek. Um, it supports over submarine salmonid populations. Um, we've continued to work with CDFW and, um, and NIMS every year to, um, to continue those releases, and um, that um, seems to be um, very effective, so we're very proud to be able to partner with them on that. Um, we are also working on a safe harbor um, with uh, National Marine Fisheries and CDFW to encourage other grape growers um, to share their water as well. And um, lastly, and perhaps most importantly, um, we've looked at how um, our culture within our organization impacts the, the amount of water that we use. And um, we've been able to, um, to foster the, a culture of, um, of water saving and um, the value of, of being very um, uh, uh, careful with our water use throughout our, our business. Um, and um, so we have a lot of wonderful employees to thank for that. Um, thank you very much for having me here today. Um, I ha had a couple of requests. Um, uh, as um, uh, we've done in the past, um, we would be very happy to um, talk um, with um, anybody about uh, the passage of legislation that affects agriculture and how, um, and use our, um, what we've learned through sustainable um, farming um, to help make um, uh, any legislation uh, more effective and um, less costly. Um, we are very committed to proactive management um, of water and to protect the quality of our environment. And um, we are very um, interested in helping um, in any way um, we can to um, help with that process. Um, we also um, wanted to say thank you for supporting legislation that promotes programs that are forward-thinking and collaborative. Um, without the CDFA Healthy Soils Grant, um, the California Energy Commission and the Natural Resource Conservation Funding Programs, um, our vision of what is possible um, in agriculture would not be achievable, and we're um, very um, grateful for that. So thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Either one of you have any questions? So I, first of all, I want to um, just, I'm in awe from what we are doing because um, I know it's tough to do these things. It's not every small a farmer can do this and um, that you being a leader is phenomenal. Um, I've been at the UC Davis to the, um, the facility. It's mm -hmm. phenomenal. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm really excited that you are taking advantage of Healthy Soils because it's one of those programs I truly believe in. And yes, we have a budget ask in there, uh -huh. trying to make sure we get that funded this year, as uh -huh. well as other programs that can help out. So um, sometime I'd like to come over and take a tour oh. and um, see more of what you're doing maybe at one of your locations um, off-site. I, I love this kind of stuff. So thank you for what you're doing. Yeah. It's really great. 
And to all of you on the uh, panel, thank you very much for coming today. Um, it means a lot to us that you've taken the time out of your day. This is important information um, that we will promise to take back to our uh, constituents, I mean to our legislators as well, and hopefully um, help promote um, the wine industry in all agriculture. So thank you very much for this information. Is there any public comments? Is that what you want me to do? Anybody else have any public comments? Any high fives or anything else? <laughs> Could I offer one more yeah. piece of information I left out, which is actually really important in the Russian River, and it's uh, the forecast informed reservoir operations activity that we're piloting here in the Russian River. And this is a collaborative program across federal, state, and local agencies uh, looking at how the operations of Lake Mendocino can be modified to increase the benefits that the project can provide, improving supply reliability in the basin, and using it as a pilot that might be leveraged for information to other uh, water projects in the state. And uh, so really appreciate the efforts going on here that create that opportunity to explore these new ideas in the use of our existing facilities. And just to add it on to that, and I think there's obvious complications being candid with Lake Mendocino, as we need to be able to work with the Army Corps. I think eventually Lake Mendocino, or the County of Mendocino, County of Sonoma, uh, along with uh, the County of Marin, would like to be able to see Coyote Dam raised. Um, and how that could happen, it's been discussed for a couple of decades now, and I'm sure it's going to be discussed for a couple of decades more. Um, but uh, long story short, going to need that water supply long term. And that just brings to the question of what do you see for the Northern California region as our climate is changing? Uh, what do you see since we're not dependent on snowfall, but these atmospheric events? Um, what do you see for our region between, uh, if you will, Santa Barbara on north? Any thoughts you want to have on that? Sure. So we actually spend a fair bit of time looking at this issue and looking at uh, understanding the role of atmospheric rivers and their contribution to our seasonal water. Yeah. Uh, particularly more importantly here on the coast where snowmelt is not a part of the water budget. Yep. And looking and seeing that is the world warms uh, the notion that uh, maybe the bulk of the distribution of the character of atmospheric river events doesn't change, but the really big ones that part of the tail jumps out a few standard deviations, so the big events get really big. And the ability to manage across the spectrum of those events and truly understanding the ability to forecast and the role that will play in um, preparing what we do. And so there, there is a fair bit of investment, the, the effort being made. Um, as I mentioned in observations, actually Scripps is out here uh, during this event doing some uh, monitoring uh, for the Sonoma County Water Agency. And I think supporting programs like that that continue are improving our knowledge. And then, as I said, with projects like AQPI, leveraging that information to feed back. And maybe some of the missing component is that collaboration is allowing the good work that happens locally to be fed back so that it could be leveraged to other parts of the state and, and finding a, a vehicle for that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, let's give a round of applause to our panel and say thank you uh, for their work and thank you for being here. Well, thank you all for uh, joining us. We'd like to be able to go to closing comments uh, from each of our co-hosts. And we'll start with the Stanley woman with any closing comments and we'll go to uh, Mr. Dodd. Um, again, thank you very much for um, um, all of us working together on this. These are these committee hearings always enlighten me in so many ways. But uh, thank you so much for coming, all of you that presented. Um, we appreciate the input, and always know that our doors are open. We have we like to listen. We like to find out more information. Uh, just don't wait till the last minute. <laughs> so thank you very much for coming today. Thank you so much, Mr. Dodd. Yeah, I too like would uh, to thank. Uh, you all for coming. I think more importantly that that more important that's that's what makes these uh, committee hearings uh, valuable and the contributions from all our speakers today I thought were just outstanding and I appreciate that very much. I also like to thank uh, uh, the respective staffs that uh, do the work behind the scenes to put these on. Thank you very much and thank you to the chair. 
No, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Co-Chair. Uh, we'll just offer my thanks to all of our panelists and for all of you for hanging with us here today. Uh, echo what uh, Senator Dodd just said, none of this would be possible without each of the teams from uh, Ms. Aguiar Curry's office, Senator Dodd's office, and our office, and just want to say thank you so much uh, for all of your efforts. You could just raise your hand and let's give them a round of applause, please, and say thank you. Kim, Carlene, there we go. And they said, no, thanks, we're not going to raise our hand. Okay, <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, I think on, uh, just want to end it with on recovery and rebuild. Uh, we have a long way to go, whether you are a hotel owner, a winery owner, or a homeowner. Um, this county and our three neighboring counties have been hit hard. Uh, Ms. Cruz didn't mention this, but uh, she also lost her home. Uh, and there are so many of us that continue to struggle. And I think the important part of all of this is whether you are in business or a renter or a homeowner, we have to work together. I think that's the important part as we uh, really are entering the hardest phase of this recovery uh, here in the years ahead is being able to get this community rebuilt and just want to say how grateful we are to the industry for working together. Uh, as Senator Dodd uh, mentioned, it was pretty cool hearing how uh, Napa and Sonoma are working together, traditional rivals, watch out, friendly rivals, by the way. It was my understanding that Napa had to recognize that they did have a huge auto parts uh, uh, association. <laughs> there we go. I mean, exactly. We've heard this for years. That's right, exactly. <laughs> but uh, we're, we're very grateful, and we'll be following up here. And thank you all uh, for coming, and have a wonderful weekend. We're going to be adjourned. And thank you to our uh, co-chairs as well, and appreciate their work and partnership. Thank you so much. Thank you.